Welcome to the Two Tobies podcast. On the mic is Corey. Um, and here, my host with me is Toby Walker. Hello, my name is Toby Walker, and welcome to a new week. Yes, welcome to a new week. It's been a couple weeks since we since we did this. Um, a lot has happened since the last time we talked. A lot. Uh, the last time we talked, I think we were talking about... Do you remember what topics um, that we touched on? We were talking about cancel culture, Harper's, cancel, yes. and... The Harper's Bazaar yeah. um, letter. Uh-huh. Letter for... Um, I think it was open uh, for open for justice and, and open debate. Uh, yeah. Um, and here we are. Several weeks later, RBG died. Yep. For those that don't know, RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, she was a very iconic figure in American politics. Um, she started out from the humble beginnings in New York. Uh, I think she started out a very working class family, and she worked her way up to the highest courts in the land. Yep. And became a Supreme Court, su- Supreme Court Justice. Supreme Court yeah. Justice, uh, one of the nine. Um, and I think she's she was a second lady. Yeah, she, she was a second lady. Second lady. Um, for those that don't know, she was a very very pivotal figure in in getting a lot of um, uh, women's rights laws in place mm-hmm. um she was very 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 f- key in that she fought a lot of those battles yes. um and she started like i said she she kind of rose through the ranks and she she she, she excelled at what she did mm. uh, she is considered one of the i guess liberal leaning judges mm. which is why it's a big deal mm-hmm. um and as you know she was ahead of um like just like interject, like on the court. Yeah. Even though people like, like say the court, quote unquote, is impartial, blah 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 blah. Yeah. She she basically was like the head of the liberal wing. Of the liberal wing. Yeah. So. And her, I guess the, the her counterpart would have been Scalia, right? Yes. Before he died. Yes, before he died. Who was kind of like he kind of like ran the, the yeah. conservative side. Yeah. But they were friends. Yeah. Apparently they were friends. Extremely close friends. Yes. And let me just add. Yes. If both of them could be friends, they could go, they, they could go to Oprah shows together, you yeah. know, they could go to events together, go on vacations together. Yes. There is no reason why any of us should hit one another over yes. political views. It really, like, you know, like they were at the far ends of the political spectrum when it yes. came to their politics and their ideology. And I'll also add, like, all the decisions they were making and things like that, like, had profound and far-reaching implications on the whole country yes but all of us who argue we have no we really exactly did, all we have is a vote exactly they, that's all they they re- they really did have power exactly you know what i'm saying and they made up what like uh one ninth or i guess two ninths of of the th- of the third branch of government True. essentially mm-hmm. so and they were still able to get along. I'm glad you brought that up because you're very right about that. They were still able to be cordial with each other. Exactly. And have respect for one another despite how much they disagreed. Exactly. But I bring up RBG because this is like a this is like a another crazy twist and turns a twist a crazy twist and turn for 2020. And we've had many. Um, starting with beginning of this year. Uh, we had the impeachment that the Democrats put in place that ended up not obviously not going forward. They weren't able to, they impeached him, yeah. but it wasn't they weren't able to take him out of office. Yeah. Trump, that is. <clears throat> like that wasn't crazy enough. What happened next to me? And then we had um, Ahmed Arbery in Georgia. No, nope, no, nope. COVID. COVID came for. Oh, was it uh, Ahmad? Yes, because that was around February. You're right, you're right. Long. Ahmad. Ahmad came, even though COVID had started, but the public yeah. didn't know of it yet. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Ahmad Arbery happened, and that was already had already started. Like it was like a pressure cooker, almost at that point. Things were already kind of boiling over when it came to race tensions, because mm-hmm. that was seen as one of those really unjust killings. Mm-hmm. Um, and then COVID came. COVID came. Pandemic hit. The worst that we've seen in the last hundred years. Um, Devastated businesses, devastated people, killed thousands of hundreds, lives, thousands. hundreds of thousands. We're at two hundred thousand at this point, right? We passed yep. two hundred thousand mark. Two hundred thousand. 
So COVID came, and then what happened after? And then George Floyd came. George Floyd. And all hell broke loose. Broke loose. Everything has just been turned to shit ever since. And our political landscape has gotten even more toxic. It's gotten even more divided. It's gotten more, I don't even know what other words to use, but it's, it's not pretty. <laughs> and fast forward to last week, last week Friday, I believe. Yes, Friday, if I'm not wrong. The announcement, what, where were you when, when you heard the announcement? And what was your first reaction? Okay. When you heard RBG died? Let me just say the whole story. I was actually working on an application for something. Yeah. And for some reason, I decided to check Facebook because Facebook distracts everyone. Yes. And I saw a notice on my Facebook, which indicated that, you know, someone flagged my name and I was like, what? And then I checked and the person said, we have a winner here. And basically what happened was um, sometime last year, I believe on the 29th of December last year. Yeah. Someone like, posted a message on, on Facebook and said, any celebrity death predictions for this year? Mm -hmm. And I said, RBG. What? You did? Yeah. <laughs> what made you say that? Um, she, she had been cancer. She has been having health issues for a while. Mm -hmm. And there has been so much talk about, is she going to survive till the end of Trump's term or even Trump's mm -hmm. whole eight years? Yeah. And just knowing everything around, like, the following she had, the kind of, you know, celebrity around her name and things like that, that was something that just came to mind. I was like, there's a chance she might not make it through. Really? 2020, yeah. Now, now let's keep in mind, right? Mm -hmm. RBG, they, they, it was said that she had considered leaving during Obama's administration. Is that, is that correct? Uh, okay. oh, was that a rumor? Actually, let me actually explain what happened during the Obama's ad administration. Like, during the, if you remember during the Obama's administration, the Republican Party took control of the Senate, I believe, in the midterms of 2014. Yes. And people told RBG, I believe like in 2012, 2013, that things are still safe right now. Yes, and that, that you can leave. Leave right now while wow, there's a Democrat Senate, mm -hmm. a Democrat president, mm -hmm. so that, you know, he can change, you know, who will, who will take over from you. Yes. And she basically said, no. And obviously, what... And what was her reason? Was it because she wanted, she, she thought, uh, the, the people have speculated that she thought Clinton was going to be the next exactly. president. And she wanted to be picked by, a, by, by the by, first female president. Exactly. She wanted the first female person to pick her. I mean, no offense person. to the dead or anything, but that was such a poor calculation. I mean, absolutely. obviously, 2020 is hindsight, but, I mean, like, but still. Absolutely. Like, one thing I would also say, and this is kind of going off on a tangent here, and mm -hmm. once I say this, we should quickly go back on track, is mm -hmm. even as much as around the 2012, 2013 time, Yeah. Obviously, no one could possibly see all the political developments that have taken place since then. Yeah. In terms of Bernie Sanders, in terms of Donald Trump. Yeah. Even I myself, as far back as then, I could tell that the next few years went very predictable. So, like, let me give a solid example. Yes. In 2012, shortly after Obama won re-election, mm -hmm. he used an executive order to do DACA. Yes. And I remember at that time, one of the things I said was, as much as I feel that, yes, something needs to be done for the kids who were brought here. Yes. I felt that, like, the whole technique for going about doing DECA is fundamentally wrong. Even, it, it wasn't constitutional, yes, and he admitted Even it. Obama said 20 times that I do not have the power, and then woke he up said, one, one morning and said... And, and, and for those that aren't as, I guess, you know, politically savvy or whatever, can you explain what what you mean by it, it wasn't it wasn't constitutional what he did can you, can you explain okay. exactly okay. what he did with daca okay to begin with daca i believe it is called de um deferred action for childhood arrival so yes. like the whole idea is simplified people, people who came to this ki to this country as kids with illegally. parents who were, who came illegally yes who get like a kind of of um amnesty exception whereby they'll be regularized and things like that and yes 
I know that like they tried using the whole legislative routes to yes. actually enact DECA and even as far back as 2010 and it fell by I believe like three votes two or three votes or something yes. and DECA wasn't done and what Obama decided to do despite 20 times before that point because people have actually, have actually counted, the, counted this then it's like yeah. 20 or 22 times yeah. despite him saying that I do not have the power he signed an executive, executive order exactly basically implementing <laughs> DACA and also to give some background the way the government works and is it's meant to work and mm -hmm. we would also touch on this while talking about RGB is basically Congress is meant to either pass laws yes or change the laws which already exist yes and the president and the executive branch their job is to execute the laws yes so that's but then in this case Obama was the one exactly and essentially passing the law exactly and i remember back then one thing i actually said was guys you do not know who's going to be president in the next eight years fast and the fast forward and if they have your names on paper fast they forward. know where to come and find you yep. you guys are not been like i can bet like like if we should probably go back into my twitter history yeah. you probably can can find me you know basically mm -hmm. you know warning against this exactly and but he went through with it. Yeah. He went through with it. And fast forward, Trump got in office. Trump has been on an executive order spree. Yeah. <laughs> and he's been passing all kinds of law. And, and then he's challenged DACA. Because what he wants to do is he wants to remove DACA. Because DACA is in place, right? So mm -hmm. I think they, they challenged it. They went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said they acknowledged that, yeah, you guys may have a point but you're not arguing the right point and they sent it back they said no we're not going to remove it that if you're going to remove it you need to come up with like a more um i guess something to replace it or at least something to ensure or something along those lines but essentially yeah. they they challenged it and the supreme court sent it back mm -hmm. now i think they're going to challenge it again no if, if i'm not wrong what the ruling actually said is you guys are actually right yes to remove daca it's within your power but the ruling said something like the method you guys have yeah it was the method it was the method is, is wrong so yeah. please go back go and, back and, and do things and do properly. it again yes so which simply means like for example if trump should win again like he's probably gonna get it right it's yeah. almost like they, they was kind of like winking to him that okay you guys you guys got something here but you know do your homework essentially exactly so that's so that's part of what's at stake Daka. Yes. i'm glad you brought that up what else is at stake with with the courts being left with eight judges right now um another issue is um there is the potential that like decisions brought before the courts yes might be split decisions so for yes. example four four so like for example um if it if a case should come from the from the appeals courts mm -hmm. and i believe they call it a split in the uh, in the appeals court system whereby yes one like one appeals courts like i don't know like let's say the eighth appeals court yeah says one law is constitutional yes another let's say the second appeals court says it's unconstitutional, unconstitutional. on on the same topic it means that there's a split and yes. what happens is the supreme court yes has to have the final say and yes. if the supreme court itself is split when things like that come up it simply means that the law will revert revert back to what it was before the before yes yes so now let's talk about like something very critical and what everyone's talking about mm -hmm. there is the whole you know elections coming up yes and people feel the elections might be contested yes now, if it, it, and it, it most likely will be yeah. especially if there is million ballots exactly so now if the supreme like if if the election is contested like in the year 2000 yes and you only have it's judges on the courts mm -hmm. hypothetically it means that there might be a split decision yes. and it's things like that that you know maybe a split decision yes that, that complicates everything yes. so what they're saying now is trump is probably going to nominate somebody yes but the democrats are saying in obama's last term right mm -hmm. the republicans refused to pass to even see Obama's nomination, to even interview him. Mm -hmm. They didn't even allow it. And their justification was that, well, we're in an election year. Um, and 
I guess, and they said there's precedence for this, right? Mm -hmm. They said we're in an election year, and as a result, we have to let the people decide, and we have to let we have to see where we end up after the election, mm -hmm. and then we can consider judges. Mm -hmm. And now there's been some back and forth. Some people say the precedence is based on the presidency and the Senate being split between two parties. Mm -hmm. This year, we have the presidency and the Senate, the same party. party. Yeah, true. They're not going to pass up on that. Then you, now, the Democrats are arguing that, well, because we did that for Obama, right, then we should have the same president and, and respect the, the people to make that decision. Mm -hmm. The problem with that argument is that with both the presidency and the Senate having the power, the decision was already made four years ago. Like let me let me actually add something here, and okay. this is kind of key for people to understand real context where yes. this whole thing is coming from. Mm -hmm. A couple of days ago, I was scrolling through YouTube, and since the beginning of this year, I believe it's called um, PBS has been running a whole bunch of documentaries, even before the whole George George Floyd and all the protest, yeah. just talking about how divided the country is right now, and in the latest iteration and series. There is, there is like a new um, PBS documentary called Supreme Reven Revenge. Okay. And ironically, that thing was released a couple of weeks before RBG died. And the whole premise is, in a sense, people must kind of understand where things are coming from yeah. for us to understand why we're, where we are right now. I'm going to throw out something. One thing which many people never really talk about is the whole dysfunctional system around how Supreme Court judges, judges are chosen yes. lies on the laps of Joe Biden. How so? Okay, in 1987, yes. President Reagan nominated um, someone to the Supreme Court called mm -hmm. Robert Bork. Okay. And anyone who knows Robert Bork, Robert Bork is the one, is basically the person who develops the philosophical arguments for what conservatives call originalism okay. in the 1970s and even like how and for, for those don't let's don't let's speak above people's yeah. heads. originalism is when people interpret the Text. constitution as what it, it was, was meant yeah for exactly when the constitution was written versus interpreting the constitution in the more active well i guess in, 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 in kind of like in a more progressive way where yeah. where you're interpreting it to match the times that we're in now exactly. and those are the two philosophies on yes. how you approach the constitution originalism and what what's the other one um, called? it's called the living constitution Live it. okay yes and also robert bork is like his actual background is antitrust yes and with everything going on with um, all these big platforms and things like that, mm -hmm. Robert Bork is actually the one who developed the current antitrust paradigm. Yeah. So Robert Bork isn't some you know unqualified person. Mm -hmm. But what happened during that whole nomination is Democrats held the Senate and they scuttled the Bork nomination. And Democrats held the Senate. Who was the president at the time? President Reagan was the president. Oh, and, and it was and, split. And Joe, Aha. And, and Joe Biden was the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. What? Yes. And basically... Interesting. I didn't know that. And basically... So they, they did this yes, already. Yes. And basically... So Robert Burke never got... Bork, the nomination. Bork's then was scuttled. What well, was this? His Reagan's first or second? Second term, eight to seven. Oh, and, but then Bush came in right after. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in okay. a second. And here is a key thing: before the Bork hearings of eight to seven, mm -hmm. it was understood that it, it was the prerogative of the president to nominate whoever they want to nominate to the Supreme Court. No one yes. really fought over it. It was just formality of making sure that the person is qualified and you know going. Yes. The year before Bork was nominated, I believe in '86, mm -hmm. the Justice Scalia who died, yeah, equally went through the whole process. In many ways, we can we can even say that Scalia was probably even a more hardcore originalist than yeah. Bork. Yeah. But basically, the whole Senate yeah. allowed Scalia to pass through. His nomination vote was like ninety-six to zero or something. Yeah. And. Joe Biden actually voted for Scalia. Yeah. Well, 
okay. and in a change of one year mm -hmm. that whole process became very toxic and so wait you're telling me the democrat senates at the time blocked the no reagan's nomination yes and that was the first time it had happened the dirty way in which that thing happened was the first time that thing ever happened it shocked everyone interesting i didn't even know that yeah so you're telling me this trend of not there of, is a history of when the there is, it started with biden yes there Ain't is a, that something there is a history to this whole thing like People just posting things online. I shake my head. People have no clue what they're posting about. It began with Biden. So it began with Biden. But that was but that was in the case when there's a there's a presidency that's held by one party and the Senate is held by the other, right? Yes. And because those are the only two de no. decision makers when it comes to nominating, like, nominating justices, right? But like here's the thing: before all that began under Biden, yeah. They happen multiple times whereby a president is different from whoever holds the Senate and they still allow. They still allow. They still allow. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, that's basically what happened. And then fast forward to the year 1991. Yeah. There, there, was, there was also the Clarence Thomas hearings. Oh, yeah. That was, that was messy. Joe Biden was also the one in charge. Yeah, he was. And then you then had the Kavanaugh hearings. Oh. So, basically, there is a whole terminology called Borkin. It means you try and sink a candidate now here's the here's wait, 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 somewhat, uh, what what does what what barking no barking like barking when they say barking yeah. it, it means sink his nomination for example for Th for political reasons yes. essentially. for example thomas and this guy cabineau mm -hmm. they were trying to bark them they survived barking that was what like actually cabineau said it very explicitly mm -hmm. when he was like crying during his, his nomination that yeah what's going on is they are trying to bark him mm -hmm. So now, in this like PBS um, new so then, documentary, so then Garland got borked essentially. Yeah, in as they didn't try. But then, but then they didn't. Even, but that's the thing. They didn't even. They, they never. No, no. They, Borkin in Borkin involves impugning people's reputation. Reputation. But they never got. To but that they stage. never got to that stage with yeah. Garland. Yeah. And, ah. And here, here is here. Wow. Here, okay. Here, here is a key part you really need to understand. In this PBS documentary called Supreme Revenge, which I stumbled on, mm -hmm. there was a very young Kentucky senator who was a freshman called Mitch McConnell, mm. who was looking at everything. <laughs> and basically the whole idea is that whole experience radicalized him. <laughs> the so, chickens came home to roost. So basically, like McConnell today is basically doing revenge he's like yo i seen this joint man i seen i exactly. saw all this stuff happen in exactly. front of me and i would also add something like why oh, like the whole um nomination process is so contentious and i feel it's something people really need to understand yeah in america they tell us theoretically that hey the way government happens is you have a congress which passes laws yeah. a president which executes the laws yeah. um a court which interprets the laws that's kind of wrong today in america congress isn't involved in governance yeah where government in america takes place is in the courts and in administrative agencies yeah yeah that, yeah that's where government takes place like yeah. the whole thing of there's a congress congress is all a show and a shell yeah like so basically everyone understands that whoever controls the courts Control. You are basically controlling how policy is done in this country. Yes. That's why this whole process is... It's getting so much more contentious. Exactly. And it, it is probably also as a result of the fact that our politicians are are becoming more and more beholding to people outside of the constituents and more to exactly. corporate interests. Absolutely. And that, and, you know, that problem has only progressively gone worse. Mm -hmm. So as a result, it, it the... the legislation is just they just and, there they just figureheads essentially i would also add something like one thing like like democrats are actually saying is that like if donald trump goes ahead and fills the courts what they're actually going to do is they're going to try pack the courts and yeah and by packing the courts what they really mean right is add additional justice. justices yeah. so and, and 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 when they say that what that signals to me is 
they've conceded that look, these guys are gonna get away with this because they are gonna nominate yeah. their president, uh, their yeah. the SCOTUS. Mm -hmm. um, the person who is being considered right now is Amy Coney Bar Barrett. Yeah. Um, she is also an originalist. She clerked under Scalia. Scalia. Uh, so, and she's a Catholic also. Yeah. I mean, they, I've been seeing some smears coming out about her. They're probably going to try to bork her too, right? At this point, they they're going to bork anybody that, sh that shows up. At this point, it's, it's, a, it's a scorched earth, 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 earth approach earth for yeah. everything. Yeah. Anyone that gets in the center of this political divide we have right now is is toast exactly their reputation regardless is toast they already started calling her a crazy speaking in tongues lady yeah <laughs> they, yeah. they started i started and, seeing that no no well like there is something key i must really touch on in this whole cuts courts parking thing yeah what everyone kind of figures is that if they should try to pack the courts it will mm. delegitimize the courts because it'll become very it will. it'll become very obvious to everyone that this whole thing is, is politics and it's yeah. not a bunch of you know you know judges who do not have their own preferences but here is what something else some people are also saying yeah and i'm not gonna lie i kind of buy into that argument which argument i was listening to, to a podcast by someone a few days ago and the person brought in some professor who is like an expert on the courts as we're saying about jefferson and things like that yeah and the man was like you know that as much as you know he might not be for the politics of the Democrats, mm -hmm. he actually wants them to expand the courts. He said, if they should expand the courts, mm -hmm. the scales will fall off everyone's eyes, mm -hmm. that the courts are a political instrument, and it's a force the whole country to begin telling Congress that begin doing your job. Mm. So he said, mm. he said, as much as you know, he might not be for their politics, yeah. he does actually want them to expand the courts, so that like- It's never happened though, or has it? It has happened, and I'll tell you how. Oh. Um, in the late 1860s, yeah, the court was expanded and then they reverted back its size, I believe, under President and Andrew Johnson. The really? Fir the, the first president to be impeached. Yeah. And why, at the time, they reduced the size of the courts mm -hmm. was to ha basically have favorable, you know, favorable court rulings. Yeah. And, and you know, prevent Johnson from being saved. But President Roosevelt also tried to expand the courts in the 30s, but there was a public backlash against that idea. Hmm. Because what happened was, again, some history here, I believe up to 1938 or so, yeah. a lot of Roosevelt's, of Roosevelt's New Deal was ruled unconstitutional by the courts. And Roosevelt was frustrated and began saying that he wants to expand the courts. It, so there's a trend here because you named Andrew Jackson, you named Roosevelt, yeah. you named um, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. What? And then, Look, and then, oh, wait, no, let me finish. And then now we have, and Rich then we have, and then, and, no, and then we have Obama, and then we have Trump. Yeah. What? Did, what? Like, what would you say all those presidents have in common? They were, they were very divisive. Andrew Jackson was True. a, a flamethrower. No, no, not Andrew Jackson. Andrew Johnson. Oh, Andrew Johnson. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. But, but Andrew Johnson was another divisive, divisive. drunk. And, yeah. yeah but, Roosevelt, too. I mean, obviously, he was very divisive, too. Yeah. Ronald Reagan. He was... Divisive. He's, he's one of those presidents that... Everyone has a strong opinion. Democrats, about. like everyone has a strong opinion. Like you talk to Republicans, they're like, he's our God. You talk to Democrats, he's the devil. He's the devil. And then Obama also, it's funny, Obama, the way Obama governed, he wasn't, he wasn't that divisive in his governing, but he still elicited I was, this, I would say something, this strong emotions. I'll say something about Obama, and this might kind of come out as controversial. To me, there's no difference between Trump and Obama. Policy-wise, or in terms of how they temperament, Obama temperament. Obama is a more polished version of Trump. Temperament. Yeah. Explain that. Where Trump might be very blunt, and Trump might just say what he wants to say, mm -hmm. and Trump will say it in you know two words. Yeah. Obama will weave around, mm -hmm. you know, dazzle you people, oh, yeah. but at the end of the day, because like what really made my eyes fall down? Okay, not my eyes. Um, the scales fall off my eyes was. I was listening to um, Obama's speech during John Lewis's um, 
John Lewis's um, funeral. Yeah. <clears throat> and where he began talking, I just looked and said, wow, this could drop out of Trump's mouth. This is something Trump is capable of saying. Hmm. Because one thing about Trump and also Obama, you people must never forget, I consider both of them populist. Hmm. How, because, how is Obama a populist? <clears throat> remember how Obama ran in 2008? Yes. Obama ran on decrying the whole system, how it's full of lobbyists, how yeah, he's he not ran a, on hope. How he's not a member of the system, but obviously with time, all that talk. He, he became part and pa um, yeah. parcel. Which also goes to show, and this is kind of going on a tangent, we'll come yeah. back, is that like the whole populist sentiment yeah. did not begin with Trump. It's been around for well over a decade. Hmm. Okay. Like what? so. So in a way, Trump was the reaction to Obama. He, not, he, he was the. I guess he was the backlash. No, I. I didn't even buy that whole. You don't thing. buy that. I didn't even buy that whole thing of Trump was a backlash to Obama. I don't buy that. How? Yeah. How did then? How did Trump end up in office? Because that. I mean that. That's as okay, un, like, unprecedented as it gets. You know, like here is the main thing. Trump tapped into sentiments which already existed. Because here's the thing. As much as Obama was a hope and change person, he talked about how corrupt the whole system is and things like that. Obama pretty much made peace with the system almost immediately. And just jettisoned the whole talk of, you know, um, lobbyists control Washington, D.C. And, and things like that. Mm. But Trump is a person who not only during his campaign was he talking about that, but kept knocking on this thing even while president. And I would also add, okay, let me give like a very good, good, um, good example. One of the things with Trump has been this whole thing of um, fake media, the media is the enemy of the people and yeah. things like that. The truth about the matter is it's a wrong interpretation to say that Trump introduced those sentiments into the American political sphere. Those sentiments already existed. A very good example, I believe it was in 2012 during the Republican, the Republican primary presidential debate. Yes. Something came up about, I believe, Newt Gingrich's, like, you know, wives he had, he had had, affairs he had had, and things like that. Yeah. And he was asked that question, and basically, the guy just, you know, lashed out at at the person who asked the question and said, how dare you ask this during a debate? I mean, this, if this was President Obama, you guys would never ask questions like this. Mm. This is why people hit, um, this is why people hit, hit the media. You guys are not doing your job. Mm. And something very key, the whole crowd in the whole debate room, which obviously was majority Republicans, for like two to three minutes, mm -hmm. kept cheering and clapping him on. I think I remember. I think I kept happened. cheering and clapping him on meaning that all these things to do with like you know how the media the enemies of the people fake news their sense the sentiment has always been trump there. trump just figured a thing or two out and said wow he knew he knew how to he gave it good he gave it he knew how to um I'm trying to think of the word channel he knew how to channel it and he he the way he made the case mm -hmm. He, like he made it, like even people that disagree with Trump agree with Trump that the media mm -hmm. is an attack mm -hmm. for certain figures. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like mm -hmm. he he was the first person. Like because I used to hear him say fake media, fake, and it, it took me a while, you know, to come to that realization. It took me being a mem a fan of Bernie in the 2016 election. I I mean I've talked about it already, yeah. but I'll go over it again. Yeah, it just come from Donald just announced Amy. Yeah. Amy so. Coney Barrett. Yeah. So we, I mean, that was expected. Um, huh? Oh, the volume? My phone? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, where was I? Yeah, 75%. You good. Um, <clears throat> I lost my chain of thoughts. <laughs> can we, yeah. Anytime I see these alerts, man, yeah. I kind of lose my mind a little bit um, because I, I can only imagine what's going on online right now. I know what liberals saying, are losing their minds. <laughs> what? What you were saying is, um, it took you being like a fan of Bernie Sanders. Oh, Bernie Sanders, to, like, for me realize. to for me to see 
how the media mm -hmm. colluded with Hillary. And that was what kind of like broke the cycle in my head. That was when I realized that, oh, I see what's going on here. I, like, I see what's going on here. I see I'm at these Bernie rallies. They're not giving it coverage. They're giving Hillary coverage. And Hillary could, couldn't pack a room yep. at the time. Yep. There was, it was so obvious. And that was when I realized how biased the media was. And Trump, at the same time, kept talking about fake news media, fake news media, fake news media. So it's, it's almost like, wait, this guy kind of has a point. Now, obviously, he also abuses that fake news media yeah, thing where, man, where he... Trump is Trump. He, you know, he's, Trump is going to Trump. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And there are times when he just calls on the fake news media when he's trying to deflect from other things. Mm -hmm. Fair. But you couldn't deny that there was something off with this with the media. Yeah. And with the mainstream media especially. Mm -hmm. But I'm going off on a tangent. Um We're talking about RBG. Let's Yeah, let's so let's so let's try to so let's try to wrap up the RBG discussion. Yeah. She's been nominated. Yeah. Amy Coney Barrett. Coney Barrett. What like what do you see happening in the next couple of month and how do you see this affecting the election um one thing i'll predict the democrats might kind of overplay their hands and i'll tell how you so? how um she was nominated for like um an appeals um as a judge on i believe the seventh appeals court or something mm -hmm. around 2017 or 2018 yeah and i believe it was diane feinstein of california said something like the dogma lives loudly in you. And you know that like a huge part of Trump's constituents are like evangelical Christians, mm. social conservatives. Yep. So basically, if Democrats aggressively go on the whole thing of she's Catholic and the whole religious angle, mm -hmm. that then will galvanize um, religious voters. Because like, here's the main thing like basically the way that whole constituency will view everything is like an attack on her mm -hmm. is an, an an attack on, on them so that's how and, and on their religious beliefs exactly they've already started coming at her they said she joined this cult well they labeled it a cult yeah. but it's really not a cult it's no different from the communities you see in at redeem church mm -hmm. it's like they they made because they said because they made a pledge. Did you hear about it? They said that within her Catholic community, mm -hmm. there's this other like sub community um, sub community that they have where they kind of like make a pledge to you know to kind of hold each other accountable mm -hmm. um, based on the teachings of you know Christ or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those communities that they have, and mm -hmm. she happens to be in in one of them. A member, a member of that, and they, but there someone labeled it a cult. So and that's where it starts. You see what I'm saying? That's where it starts. Because ev evangelicals are going to hear what it's all about and they're going to be like, what? Ex exactly. What, what, a cult? But here's the thing. Here's my thing, right? I think decisions were already made a long time ago. I don't think there's going to be that much more evangelicals that would have voted for Biden that are going to suddenly be like, oh, well, now we're going to, you know, like I don't, I don't think there's really going to be that. At this point, the, I, mean, I, I see the effect of this SCOTUS nomination as just adding more noise and adding more fuel to the fire that's about to come in November. One thing I would also add, like just talking about like the like the long term effects of like actually having her on the courts. Yes. Personally, I think people are just overblowing the effects of her being on the courts. And I'll tell you why. I do not necessarily think the courts will all of a sudden become as conservative as people imagine. I do not think so. Like, the history simply doesn't back that. Because there's like a very good history and trend of judges who are nominated by Republicans. Yeah. Not living up to the hype people put around them. Yeah. So, I mean, the, Ro Roberts is one of those judges. He's cited on a, a bunch of cases now with the liberals. Uh, in fact, he's, no, he's kind of considered a... No, here's the thing, here's the thing about Roberts. Yes, on the outside, it looks as if he has sided with them. But in many cases, Roberts just simply says, you guys, go back and think this thing all over again. Please come back with some more, you know, well-reasoned arguments. Because here is the main thing. 
you also shouldn't forget that Roberts is like the head of the courts. He's, 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 he's the chief justice of the whole country. Yeah. And part of his whole thinking and what bothers him is maintaining the legitimacy of the courts, how it looks in front of the whole country. But how did that happen, though? How did what happen? I thought it was by, by seniority, right? Okay, here's what happened. I believe when Roberts was nomin... No. Roberts came during Bush's time. San- Sandra Day O'Connor, like, left the courts. That yeah. was the first lady. Yeah. They tried replacing her with another lady, Harriet Mayers. And then the conservative base had a backlash okay. against her nomination, and they had to withdraw their nomination. Okay. Then, I believe, is the order right or wrong? Yes, I believe they then brought in Roberts. Okay. And then while they brought in Roberts, and they were trying to go through the whole process, yeah. the chief justice of the country at the time, Rehnquist, died. So, okay. ba- so basically, Bush promoted Roberts from being an associate nominee to nominate for chief justice and then brought in Adlito to fill the, that spot. The so, spots. Yeah, so, so that's how Roberts became the chief justice. But, but then you have Clarence Thomas. I get, well, yeah, they, they, they it, always say Clarence Thomas has always taken like a backseat approach to, to, yeah. to things. He's, he's like the more quiet one out of the bunch. I mean, yeah, he's quiet, but people have like Given it lots of tropes around him being quiet about, you know, meaning that he doesn't know what he's doing. But really speaking, if anything, for, for like the so called conservative legal movement, mm-hmm. Thomas is the boss. Like, basically, mm. Thomas is where, like, Thomas is where everyone gets all their intellectual ideas from. Really? Yeah. So, so, so like, basically, in this court right now, <clears throat> Thomas is basically the head of the conservative wing, not even Roberts. Mm. No, even Roberts and um. Yeah. Uh, another another thing on the ballot is the whole abortion thing, the abortion fight. I know, I know the issue which I kind of think is overblown. You think so? I'll say you really you because Kavanaugh has been on record saying that he thinks. Well, he said that he doesn't he doesn't like the idea of challenging established. They call it like established law, or whatever. Like thesis. I believe that's what it's is called. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Like something that they don't want to undo certain things. Amy, however, has challenged that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and what we're talking about here is really Roe v. Wade. Yeah. It's the idea of rolling back Roe Ro v. Wade. I mean, now yeah. it's happened before that they've rolled back certain laws. It, it's, it happened very rarely, but it's happened before. Let me actually kind of go back to what I was saying about I believe people's worries are overblown. Mm hmm. The last time Roe v. Wade was challenged, a Republican-dominated court basically upheld Roe v. Wade. Upheld Roe v. Wade, right? So, I mean, like, it's really questionable. And I'll also add, because we're talking about RBG, mm-hmm. even RBG, who is a fan of Roe v. Wade, mm-hmm. and is basically one of the people who helped, you know, in bringing about Roe v. Wade into being in the 70s, mm-hmm. is actually on record as saying that Roe v. Wade was a mistake. She said that? Yeah. Really? Yeah, she said it was a mistake. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check. Yeah, check it. She has actually said it was a mistake. And I'll see why she said it was a mistake. She said that at the time, people, they never could have envisioned that almost 50 years later, though, that it would be such a contentious issue. Really? And she said that she felt that what Ruby Wade ended up doing was uniting Protestants and Catholics together. So, like, all the whole thing of, you know, Reagan in the 80s and things like that, she feels like it was a factor that um, contributed to the the rise of the, of the rights, like in the late seventies, early eighties. Really? Yeah. She has like she has actually said that, in a way, it was it was a mistake. Interesting. I'm trying to find. Yeah. But I don't want to go through this long. Yeah. I mean, like, all, like all I'll just say, and people can go down that rabbit hole and mm-hmm. you know, go read the things up yourself. I'm not going to say them on air. She has said a lot of what well, I'll just simply call interesting things about Roe v. Wade. Uh, did you hear what she said about Black Lives Matter? What did she say? She said that Colin... Hold on, let me look it up. I know, I know like she said like Colin Kaepernick like kneeling for the flag. Was oh, yes, yes. Dumb. So, Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it was Colin Kaepernick. She said it was dumb that the idea of kneeling for the flag, she kind of just said it was not. Nah, it was it was silly. In in that something, I mean, look here. Look here is the main thing, and I feel it's what people like kind of, kind of need to understand about her is, I feel she comes from a generation that's more, should I say, calculating, mm -hmm. introspective in what they do. Yeah. And she can like see that look in Nilin, there is a potential that people who you might be able to somehow persuade, mm -hmm. you're putting them off. That's probably what she's, she's, she's thinking. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure, okay, don't let me speak for the dead, but like there's a high chance that like, like on issues like, you know, that Colin Kaepernick is talking about. Yeah. She might be in agreement with them, but she might be like, look, her way, his way of doing it. I just don't just agree not with how you're going about doing things. That's, you know, that's how I agree. Um, so this is the quote that you're talking about. Um, in, in 1992 talk at New York University that she later turned into a law review article, Ginsburg argued that the court had been right to strike down the Texas anti-abortion law challenged by the plaintiff Jane Roe. But Ginsburg said that the justices erred in their breathtaking decision to render virtually every abortion restriction in the country illegal. Ruth Bader Ginsburg thought the ruling in Roe v. Wade was correct, but too sweeping. Yeah. A narrow dis decision, she felt, was normal and proper judicial behavior. And if the court had, ex had, had exercised more restraint, the country would not have had the decades of controversy we have witnessed. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. But here's the thing about I want to get back to this, though. The, if it's true that she wanted to be nominated by a... By a female president. president. Basically, Hillary. Isn't that like kind of, kind of narcissistic in a way? Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to speak ill of the dead, but think about it. That, that, that is not calculated at all. She was willing. To, she was so sure that Hillary was going to win that she was willing to, she was willing to base her her replacement and bet it on, on the idea of being nominated by a female president. But I feel here is also the main issue wait so what, what, what was she trying to say was she trying to say that she she valued the wisdom of a female president over a male president like no I think, what was that about i think in in many ways it's more of the symbolism around you know the symbolism yeah um, so and so um, that goes back to this narcissistic yeah and way of approaching things and i mean i would just also add in a way that like uh, well, I mean, to be to be kind of truthful right like obviously as we're said many times on this show mm -hmm. there's a ton she did in life which quite frankly many of we males can't even do a tenth and oh, yeah. you know we should adore yes. but i feel in many ways like the whole cult of celebrity kind of got the worst at her mm -hmm. notorious rbg yeah because like like sometimes you see all the you see some of these girls like championing her and you could tell they don't really know what they just they just know that we're supposed to champion this lady <laughs> exactly and and it becomes think about it, it becomes trendy think about it if if millions of people are praising you for years and years it gets to your I head i think after a while something is it gonna, gets to your head exactly and it gets to your head and just and just talking about like you know the whole emergence of trump in general mm. also even up to the very last minute when trump was already candidate was on the ballot mm. Everyone assumed that Hillary will be president. Even mm. Paul Ryan assumed Hillary will be president. Yep, he did. So it's just one of those things no one ever saw coming. Yeah, but as a judge, you're really not supposed to get in the weeds of the politics. You really aren't. You're supposed to stay away from no, it. No, but it comes back to what we're saying. There is the myth where thoughts about how you know judges are impartial. They, she she, she, she reality, knows she knows their power. She knows how powerful they but are. In reality, judges are not impartial. Like those guys set like breathtaking decisions and they do, man. They do. But Trump has been packing the courts. Yeah.